The activists here were, not off, were often not well known. They were everyday people who were working class. They were mothers. Um, they were fathers. They were high school students. They were college students. But they made an impact that was felt throughout the nation and that was felt throughout the world. OK, so that's me. Um, I, uh, City College of San Francisco, uh, I graduate of San Francisco State and native to the Bay Area. So just a little bit about origins, how people of African descent come here to be in the area. Um, and so World War II changed the West from a colonial economy uh, to a one based on export and the use of raw materials to a more technologically advanced industrial economy. So World War II is what changes not just the economy, but the demographics. It changes neighborhoods. What's interesting, though, if we're talking about African Americans is that there were always people of African descent here in California, right, from the time that California was founded. And we'll look at that. But what happens during World War II is that you have a huge influx that makes African American people the second largest population here. So what that did was upset the racial norms that had been set in place. You didn't necessarily have to have black and white signs that segregated people because people had an unspoken and unwritten understanding of where they can go and where they couldn't go. And the longtime residents had were, many of them were upper middle class too, um, and even the ones that weren't had negotiated sort of their position within the Bay Area. All that was upset during World War II because not just African Americans, many groups of people came here for economic opportunities. But for African Americans, that meant a lot more because prior to 1910, 90% of African American people lived in the South as a result of debt systems of labor, convict leasing, all these vestiges of slavery that were re-implemented after its legal defeat. And so World War I, World War II were these larger peaks in that migration out of the South trying to escape Jim Crow. But what African American people found was that although they were able to create better opportunities for their children, right, like better access to education, um, less, more protection uh, from extra legal activity, uh, and they were able to create, even if by default, an unintended consequence of redlining, ethnic enclaves that were places to be celebrated, they still experienced Jim Crow uh, in the form of um, inadequate housing, in the form of police brutality, in the form of uh, inadequate education, um, a lack of employment. So these were all social forces that greatly impacted the livelihood of people, but were very much real and present and indigenous here. And I think that, so it's important for us to also make note that the African American people that came to San Francisco Bay Area took the longest route of the Great Migration, so they took some of the greatest risk. Um, the, this wave of the Great Migration, people drove sometimes for days because they could not stop in certain places that were blackout towns. Um, and they often had to leave behind family members. So the people that came here were coming here to stay they um, planted really deep roots, and they were thinking generationally. They were thinking about their children. They were thinking about their futures. And many of them came um, in hopes of better opportunities. So California has always historically acted as a refuge or the West, even before California was a state, when it became a state. Uh, and uh, even during like the Underground Railroad, people ran away to the West, you know. Um, and, but the economic opportunity provided by World War II is what drew many people. So this was a second gold rush in this area. Um, and people followed their family members. They worked in the service industries when they got here. They worked as dom domestic workers like my grandmother. They worked as truck farmers like my grandfather. And um, so we can see that in 1940, the population was a little under 5,000. But by the time we get to 1950, just you know, within a decade's time, you see how dramatically that population increases. That keeps happening until you get into the 70s, where it peaks. And then from there on, we see it dwindle down. So at one point, African Americans were the second largest population of people here. So you had vibrant African American communities working class people uh, who were able to purchase homes, who were able to establish businesses. Um, and so, so it's important to note that although this talk is about sort of 
the oppression that they experience, it's equally as important to talk about their reactions, their responses to that, um, and also how they combated that and maintain their humanity, their dignity, um, their sense of self, their families and their communities. And that's why I'm even still here today, standing in front of you today. Um, and so that number at the bottom, which is a little hidden, is 96,000, which is at the peak. So uh, second largest population here. Here's an image. And if you guys don't know, a lot of my research was done right here at this library. So this is the second, second best library in the country, second to New York. We have some of the best archives here. All of these photographs, many of the images are from the San Francisco History Center upstairs. You might find friends. I found my friends, families, and newspapers. I'm just saying. So um, the San Francisco Public Library is a gem. So I hope that we use it. So much of what you find here is from there. Here's an image of migrants in Hunters Point coming, always looking dressed. And what's important to make note of is that these people were hopeful, right? Um, that they, they had big promises and lots of large hopes. So a little bit background that I found that I think is interesting. Um, and we're going to start. I mean, it's not uh, chronologic, chronological necessarily, but we're going to go back and forth so we can get a sense of, okay, in the more modern civil rights movement, what was happening, but also what was the foundation. This leads us to some other questions, right? And I got to explore that this summer at an institute I got to be a part of at Harvard University called What Happened to the Civil Rights Movement. And we had such esteemed guests, and we were talking about uh, so this larger question of when did the civil rights movement even begin, right? So uh, is it in 1915 when people were fighting against the film Birth of a Nation? Or is it 1954 with the Brown versus Board Supreme Court decision? Uh, what constitutes a civil right? Is it a long civil rights struggle or is it more nuanced? So these are all questions I think we can think about, right? I tend to, to err on the side of a little bit of both. This is a long... Uh, civil rights struggle, all these things are interconnected, but it's equally as important for us to take, not to homogenize it, and to look at how all these individual pieces, how they're different, but also how they're connected to one another. So a little bit of interesting pieces about San Francisco. The NAACP chapter in San Francisco starts in 1929 established by Reverend John M. Brown of the uh, Bethel AME Church, which is still in existence. The original site is near the Embarcadero. Um, and this was the first, uh, the first AME Zion Church west of the Rocky Mountains was actually established here in San Francisco by African Americans too, right after, very soon after California becomes a state. So since California has become a territory of the US, there has always been a sustained black presence here, right? So that's a point I really wanted to get into. Um, so what is a civil right, if we're talking about civil rights? Traditionally and more generally, civil rights have been defined as protection from discriminatory treatment, the rights of a citizen. But in the United States, citizenship has been defined very narrowly for a long time. In 1790, citizenship was defined as free, white, and male. That was a criteria to be a citizen in the first Naturalization Act. Since then, that definition has broadened and often restricted um, and is very much is still contested to this day as people were worry about their citizenship as we speak. Um, and so it has only been through struggle and social movement for civil rights um, and citizenship has it be, that it's become more inclusive. Um, it has never been something that's given. And the, that war for citizenship, that battle for citizenship, there are battlegrounds here that's been waged right here in the San Francisco Bay Area. But that history is not talked about as much. So uh, we've established World War II, double V for victory, victory over our enemies overseas, but also victory over our enemies at home, democracy, right? Um, the second wave of the Great Migration, bringing African Americans here, but also that within San Francisco and within the Bay Area, both discrimination that was sanctioned by the law and unsanctioned by the law has always existed. You can look at the treatment of Chinese Americans and people and Chinese immigrants. You can look at even the way Southern and Eastern Europeans were treated. So we have all of these wonderful neighborhoods that we celebrate, but they actually are rooted in a history of trying to segregate people and keep them away, right? So that's an important piece of that history. So going back to San Francisco um, and that history here. 
In terms of employment, which was super important, right? Uh, especially now, and, and this is particularly important, employment, housing, police brutality. One point I wanna make throughout this whole thing is that a lot of the same struggles that people were fighting 50, 60 years ago are still being fought today. Um, and although the, they're just not as visible because the black population is dwindling, um, but they're still there and the same social forces that keep certain people, um, keep African Americans in um, a lower social status still exist. And we'll talk about that more, but focusing in on employment. So many of us are familiar with this term, last hired, first fired. And this was a common saying among African Americans. So what, employment is important because that's what drew many people here. A sharecropper can go from making $1 to $10 a day by working in places like the naval shipyards, the marine shipyards. So we're talking about big economic opportunities for people, which is why they left and took such risk. That could mean, that could change everything, not just for one person, but for their children and their children's children. So economic independence, the economic stability were a part of what African Americans defined as freedom. And that's so important for us to make note of. And that's why they came to San Francisco. San Francisco is also a very beautiful place. Um, many uh, neighborhoods like Bayview Hunters Point um, were places where people continued to grow you know, their vegetables. They had fruit trees. So they brought their Southern ways and their culture with them. So in the stores, you might start to see things like collard greens and sweet potatoes and hot sauce, the things that these people brought with them. So these people brought with them great hopes, but they also transformed the landscape of the city. They added greatly and enriched the culture here as well. Uh, look at the Fillmore, for example, you know, the culture, the music, the jazz. I mean, so if we think about the impact that African Americans had, those remnants are still with us now. And that's equally as important to highlight. But I think that while the war industry provided employment and there were non-discriminatory clauses, uh, it did not prevent people from experiencing discrimination once they got that employment. So there are instances of African American women who were more than qualified to get positions, but they were denied sort of uh, those superior positions or the positions of supervisors or managers to somebody who just started because they were white or because they were male. Something that's more well known as a Port Chicago mutiny that happened in 1944 where African-American men enlisted in the US Navy uh, were, would load munitions. And their supervisors, oftentimes who were white, would, they had a game between them where they, who can load these munitions the fastest. That munitions were very powerful. The, uh, there were warnings and even reports that said the conditions in which they loaded the munitions were quite dangerous. Um, and in 1944, two explosions happen and kill um, hundreds of people, the majority of them African-American. So I wanna read just a little bit about that. Uh, and this is from a dis somebody who experienced it, descendants, uh, Cyril Shepard. Men were screaming, the lights went out, and glass was flying all over the place. For Shepard and other seamen, a mile away from the munitions loading pier, the monstrous blast was traumatic, was traumatic enough. Loaders and others at the pier that night, 320 men lost their lives. The 1944 Port Chicago explosion was a result of unsafe loading practices. When they, so these workers are killed. You guys can see the numbers here. 202 African Americans out of 302. The white um, men in the Navy are allowed to take time off and don't have to work. The African Americans are instructed to clean up the mess and are um, asked to go back to work the next day. You can imagine how traumatic that might be, people that you know. They refuse to do so, and they're charged with mutiny. This is just one example. So they have jobs, they have this opportunity, but within that, they still have to, they're still experiencing um, the same discrimination that they might experience in the South, the same type of treatment that they were trying to escape. Um, and uh, with the close of the war industry, those employment opportunities went away. And so you had a generation of young people who were growing up with that economic base pulled from out of them. So uh, 
is we go into the 60s, away from the 50s, and into the 60s and 70s, you have a new generation, descendant of these migrants, and in 1966 alone, a California Special Youth Employment Offices estimated at least 12,000 unemployed youth, majority of them African American, majority of them living in low-income neighborhoods in San Francisco, and in 1960, um, the San Francisco Commission on Equal Employment Opportunity reported that discrimination in San Francisco may be less overt, but it exists. So it was well documented that there were discriminatory employment practices, but there was very little done um, to prevent that from happening. But the people organized against that, and we'll talk more about that. Um, let's go forward. So activism against discrimination was happening all throughout the Bay Area. So in 1960, uh, there was a boycott and picket at the Crest and F.W. Woolworth stores for their discrimination against African Americans. My great aunt talks about getting dressed to put on her gloves and her nice dress to go down to the Woolworths or go downtown. People used to get dressed up to go downtown, but not being able to sit at the lunch counters and eat. You could walk through, but you couldn't sit down and eat. That was an unspoken sort of rule. She also talks about trying to go to Ocean Beach. There used to be um, the music a mechanique and they used to have this big magnifying glass and there was a small place where they sold soda pop and other things there and she was a little girl and went there to try to buy a soda and they said you know we don't serve you here so again there's no signs but people knew and understood or were told where they could and could not go now this is happening simultaneously and in solidarity with sit-ins and boycotts and pickets that are happening in the South. So that's a very important point to make note of, that there were movements in solidarity with freedom struggles in the South, but those movements in San Francisco and in the Bay Area were not just in solidarity, but they were also fighting against the same type of discrimination and Jim Crow that people experience here. Um, and so activists were going back and forth from the South to the North to the West. And so that's an important thing that keeps coming up. And this is on Pal in Market Street. In 1961, Martin Luther King Jr. speaks at the Freedom Rally at the San Francisco Cow Palace where they were raising money for the Freedom Riders. He made frequent visits to San Francisco and we learned yesterday and talked about how Martin Luther King was even, this was one of the places that he was thinking about coming to settle in. Um, and so uh, Martin Luther King, had a great presence here, and he wouldn't be here if there wasn't a need for him to be here. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, um, and we'll think, talk about the Cow Palace and space and place momentarily, because it's interesting who's there in a few years, too. In 1963, at the Mel's Drive-In, popular San Francisco eatery, they had discriminatory hiring practices where they would only hire African Americans to work as dishwashers and as cooks in the back. Um, and a group of mostly college students organized the ad hoc committee to end discrimination. Now these college students weren't just African American. These college students, like many of the student move movements across the country, were multiracial, um, and particularly in the Bay Area. So you had people who were African American, people who were European American, people who were Asian, people who were Filipino and Filipina, people who were Native American, people who were Latino, Latina, all working together very often. So even another question, right, rhetorical, when does the civil rights movement begin? Why is it that we only think Jim Crow is in the South, but who is an activist? Who, who was even fighting for the black freedom struggle? And I think often we even racialize who that is. Um, the Bay Area created a model for interracial solidarity that we see implemented all throughout the nation. And, and the Bay Area was not, um, uh, but that's not really highlighted a lot. So you have students from UC Berkeley and San Francisco State. We all know the, what sh struggles would happen on those campuses, um, picketing. And, in, and th these were some of the largest protests of its kind in San Francisco at the time. And they were able to make gains. They did change their hiring practices afterward because they wanted people to go to eat at these restaurants, right? And so, um, we're able to, the next time you go to a Mel's drive-in and you see somebody of color working there in the front or as a manager, it's a result of these struggles from the students. So um, just some images. You guys can see here um, that you have students uh, uh, protesting. So where are the Negro waitresses? Again, people in solidarity from all different backgrounds. <laughs> 
and student protesters there outside. So I think the images are very powerful and these are images of think that we might think are limited to Selma or Montgomery, but they were here at the same time, happening simultaneously. In 1963, the civil rights movement and the struggle for equality here made a gain. The Rumford Fair Housing Act was implemented uh, after Rumford, Democrat out of UC Berkeley, and it was specifically targeted at housing discrimination. Um, housing was, is a very important thing to talk about, and all, we, all of us know today how uh, big of an issue housing is. It was even, and it was equally as um, significant in this time as well. We talked specifically about African Americans and the American dream, and for African Americans, many of whom who are coming from these debt systems of labor are tenant farmers Owning, having something that is your own, having a home, something that you could pass down, was one of the most important things. It was a key component to the African American dream, right? Home ownership. And many people, particularly in Bayview Hunters Point, were able to do that. So you had people, Bayview Hunters Point, you have some of the highest home ownership. Of course, that is, those things are changing, and then probably in a few years we'll have some different figures, but to this day, you have people who own their homes. They took that money, they invested it in capital, and many people still own their homes, especially in Bayview. Um, my grandmother was able to buy a home in um, what is now Pacific Heights. California Street used to be a predominantly black neighborhood. That area was a part of the Western Edition. So housing, both in the past and present was a key issue, and African Americans often, where they were upper or middle class, where they were living in public housing, experienced Jim Crow style discrimination when trying to attain decent um, housing. So, but in 1963, we make a gain, this is great. But in 1964, um, California nullified this act uh, it, with the passage of Proposition 14. Now, I mean, the the logic or the argument used to pass Proposition 14 was that it eroded the rights of private homeowners. But really, this was about being able to maintain segregation. So in name, it was about property rights, um, but in practice, it was very much conscious of who was living where uh, and very much conscious of race. So race wasn't necessarily written into the law, but this was an act to keep people segregated. So we think of California as this liberal place, but California actually is a very conservative place. If you actually look at uh, a legal history um, and what it's committed itself to and what it hasn't committed itself to. That same year, more protests, same student, many of the same students at the uh, Palace Hotel, um, and they were also protesting discriminatory hiring practices. This was once an important source of employment for African Americans, but after 1915, as a result of the Panama Pacific International Exposition, they sort of let decrease, decrease, decrease the amount of African Americans that they would hire. This um, mass arrest took place. They were actually very successful in getting the hotel to change some of its practices. And you can see here some of those gains made in these items below. Um, so again, students, all ethnicities, um, from various colleges and universities working together in solidarity to combat Jim Crow style discrimination um, and racism here in the San Francisco Bay Area. What I like about this picture is the sign, and it says, "Ain't nobody gun, ain't gonna let nobody, t ain't gonna let no one turn me around." This, these freedom songs were sung in the South, and these freedom songs were sung in the North. I think it's very important for us to know that the activism that is more that we're much more aware of, and that's not to say that it's the same. This goes back to that same idea of is it a long civil rights struggle? Should it be nuanced? It's not the same, but. We have to understand the importance and significance of both in order to have a truer and useful and better understanding of this very important history that obviously we need. Because 50 years later, we have not gone from slavery to freedom. We are still in a place where we're trying to struggle and understand how did we get here? Maybe Martin Luther King's question is more appropriate, where do we go from here? Um, and so this history, I think, is even more important now than ever. Let's go on. In 1964, 
Um, many of us also know about the San Francisco Auto Row demonstrations, also uh, against employment discrimination. 200 demonstrators took to the Cadillac dealership on SF Auto Row to protest discriminatory hiring practices. Um, and we also see by 1964, the black freedom struggle in San Francisco being embraced by other groups of people. I also make an important distinction between the black freedom struggle and the civil rights movement. They're two separate things. One thing that's important for us to make note of is that the black freedom struggle, which has been happening in this country since 1619, since the first people of African descent were brought here in chains and sold to English in the English colony, is that the black freedom struggle laid a created a blueprint uh, it left a model and it left a language of activism and protest that other disenfranchised groups could use as a basis. The civil rights movement is a larger movement that came to encompass many other groups of people, but that came out of a black freedom struggle. No other group of people in this country has been defined as property under the law. No other group of people in this country, in the numbers, 4.5 million, has gone from property to citizenship. Now that not play, I don't play oppression Olympics, don't get me wrong, I hate when I, we don't do that in my classroom, but I think that it's so important for us to understand and make that distinction. Um, so it comes out of that. So anyway, you got that point, we'll come back to it. The dealership did commit to better hiring practices, but really didn't you know, stick to, to their agreement, but the impact and significance of this movement was important. And there's, again, there's so much more to this history, um, but I think it's important that we, there's so we can't cover it all in an hour. So read the chapter in the fall and check back in. And I hope this quenches your thirst so you come to the library, you read more, you go into the archives because it's all there and there's a lot more work that has to be done. Before I go away from employment, I want to read you a quote from a uh, resident, local Hunters Point resident, when she talked about um, opportunities of employment. Um, again, many young people here were able to get better education than their um, parents and grandparents, but I think this point made by local Hunters Point resident uh, is very important for us to consider. In 1963, young people go to school together, they graduate off the same stage, and then when it comes to jobs, the black face is not qualified but they graduate and then my daughter has to clean up the same girl's house that she graduates with on stage. This was the reality. Um, people I've interviewed were told to sit in the back of the classroom at places like Mission High School or to get on the bus in the back of a muni bus. So we may not have had all the visible signs that, we, that are usually synonymous with Jim Crow, but the practices were real and experienced by the people. So that's important for us to make note of. In 1964, you have the Republican National Convention, Barry Goldwater is nominated, and Martin Luther King, again, which I actually didn't know until I started doing this research, is here speaking at the, Demo uh, speaking at the Republican National Convention, trying to, attempting to uh, persuade people to vote in the Civil Rights Act of 64. Um, it goes through, but I think, again, the importance of the fact that the fact that Martin Luther King is here speaks a lot to how important um, not just activism was, but also how the power that was wielded from this region, right? There were very powerful people who were committed to maintaining the status quo um, in California. Uh, from people who were governors, from people who were, I mean, so that's also important that those forces committed to white supremacy and black subordination were not only in the South. And California, you know, was one of those places where um, many of those people it were and existed. There was a lot of activism against it. In 1964, many members of the KKK supported Barry Goldwater, and this is a, a demonstration in front of City Hall, NAACP uh, members and KKK members. And in front of the Cal Palace, remember the Cal Palace, the same place that the Freedom Riders rally was to raise money, you also had people, all ethnicities, all backgrounds, all ages, demonstrating and organizing for civil rights. So those freedom songs echoed here in the West, um, and those struggles were indigenous and individual to the West. <laughs> 
and San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so a lot of this work I told you comes from this 1966 moment, so that's where we're leading up to that moment. In 1965, residents of the Sunnydale, Yerba Buena, and Alice Griffith, also known as the Double Rock Housing Communities, I make a point to not call them projects or ghettos because they're communities of people, they're families, um, many of them who lived there for generations, uh, who have positive family kinship networks, I was raised in one of those communities, and I don't think everybody that comes from those communities uh, is bad or is a criminal. So I think it's important that we even reframe how we define and categorize people from where they come from. And so these people in these communities take over a meeting of the San Francisco Housing Authority, complaining of conditions within those within some of those conditions. In that meeting, they complained of, they wanted some of their demands. They wanted um, covers over the drains, extermination of roaches and rats, installation of at least one detachable window screen for each room in each apartment, establishment of a coin-operated washer and dryer in various locations throughout the Hunters Point area, establishment of a more responsive, courteous, and effectual relationship between the San Francisco Housing Authority and tenants. These are basic necessities. What a lot of African American people wanted was just to be able to live, not just live, but to live with dignity, to be able to raise their families in a place that they could be proud of, um, and a place that was decent and clean and safe. And so the activism, I think this is also very unique to the Bay Area. Female activists were at the forefront of the civil rights struggle in the Bay Area. Whether you look at the Black Panthers, two thirds of which were women at its peak, whether you look at places like the San Francisco Bay Area and Hunters Point, where you had women um, like Eloise Westbrook uh, and, and such who are members of the Big Five who were not just leaders in their community, but were at City Hall, were in DC advocating for housing, advocating for the rights of families and children. So women activists, many of them who remain nameless and faceless, were leading the struggle here. And San Francisco, I think, is a great illustration of how ordinate, ordinary, everyday people, whether they be students or mothers, actually made big changes in the Bay Area that was felt all throughout the country and the nation, but we don't know their names. In 1966, 60 Bayview Hunters Point community members in mass attend a meeting with the San Francisco Housing Authority um, and Equal Opportunity Commission to protest the unlawful eviction practices of the San Francisco Housing Authority because people were just being evicted from their homes unlawfully. One case is when um, Ollie Wallace, a resident of one of these housing communities, after he had paid his rent, he paid it late, but he had paid it. The rent was accepted. We all, many of us rent in San Francisco, so we know once you accept that rent, I'm good, right? Ali Wallace, however, they evicted him after he paid the rent, would not give him the rent back um, because it was late. In addition, he had all these charges for the removal of his property and everything else. So what did the community members do? They did not idly sit by, they staged a sit-in and blocked the way of the, the movers and the sheriff to get into the building and he was able to keep his house. So this is the kind of community that is here. African Americans were, are, were united in their own struggles and people's neighbors were a part of their family, right? Parents used to introduce kids to other kids. They played together, they went to school together, they worked together. It's a community that was organized and it was a community that had a real sense of pride and looked out for each other and that's important. So let's look at um, some of this footage. All right. So this is that takeover of that meeting. Don't worry, it's on. This is the part. Uh, we met here with Mr. Kane, members of his staff, and three commissioners yesterday afternoon for two and a half hours with the EOC Area Board. Uh, it was agreed at that meeting that the Housing Authority would hold up all evictions and all dispossessed actions pending a re-examination of them 
We also told the ERC that we were re-examining all of our rent procedures and that when we had, we would uh, issue new ones and that we were determined that whatever procedures we adopted would be administered at the project level with uh, uh, warmth and decency and due regard to individuals' dignity. And that's all that's going to be said about that at this meeting today. So he's trying to get out of the we're meeting. Just, no, no, this is going to be... We have a, a statement to make on behalf of... We'll, we'll make it to the press. We're not... This and he's trying to shut them down, issue, and We're not going to discuss the Hunters Point problem today. No, we're not. We're not. And they I say, yes, this, you are going to Sorry. No, no. May I have a vote on the motion? And not only the press, but everyone. Right. Motion's made. The meeting is adjourned. No, the meeting cannot be adjourned now. <laughs> I'll listen to it, but not in a meeting. I got the telegram, and I've read it. You're going to have to, because nobody's going to leave this room unless you listen well, I'm going to leave this. Not Holly. So they decide to block the doors? To force them to listen. Close the door. So they're trying to get out. Close the door. Close the door. Close the door. And they use the press. And we they have long them complained and long demands. been ignored. Right. We again rehearsed our complaint. All right. Right. Number one, eviction can no longer be done in the high-handed manner with the, which has become routine. Right. We we protest any eviction which is done without exhausting all methods of re resolving the personal problems involved. Right. 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 Mr. Walter, do you have anything at all to say to this statement? Come on, Big Shot, make a statement. <laughs> I have no other statement to make other than the one I made this at the beginning of this meeting. You have a minute, you have You go through my start. We want equity! We want equity! In the long run, uh, these people or any other people can't look to the Housing Authority to cure the economic and social ills implicit in our society. The All right, we're not going to spend too much time on him because we'll get back to the. We've heard this argument before, so we can get away from that. So um, after, after they follow in this action, the Housing Authority agreed to halt further evictions because they did not want another meeting taken over with 60 people again. Um, pending a re-examination of their policy, Ali Wallace was able to keep his home. So again, that direct nonviolent protest in the Bay Area was actually able to make gains. And these were regular, ordinary, everyday people, you know, um, who we would all relate to, who we can all relate to. Um, so the housing goes on. Uh, African Americans experience residential restrictions and racial discrimination in the public sector, as we saw, but also in the private sector. In 1942, the San Francisco Housing Authority adopted uh, what was called a neighborhood pattern. Um, and this was on paper. So this is state-sanctioned um, style segregation, which limited African Americans to West Side courts and Chinese to the Pingyun housing communities. Now, this was an open and sanctioned practice by the San Francisco Housing Authority, um, and it was actually challenged in, in 1952. So this was a major victory for the San Francisco NAACP. Uh, Maddie Banks and James Charlie Jr. were sued the San Francisco Housing Authority after being denied occupancy in the North Beach Housing Project, which was their right, which made sense for these residents. They were coupled together. Um, and I want to read you some of the testimony of the director of the San Francisco Housing Authority so you guys can get a sense of that this was not just uh, people choosing to live in these areas on their own. So in testimony taken under oath, the executive director of the San Francisco Housing Authority, John Beard, openly admitted to segregating tenants based on race. When asked if a Negro with the best types of qualifications, and this is under oath, say it as a Negro veteran who has been disabled, veteran who has been displaced, and who applied for housing in Holly Court, one of the four housing developments designated for whites only, under your instruction, would you admit him to Holly Court? Beard replied, we have no displaced Negro applicants. Question, if you applicant would apply, would, if such applicant would apply, would you admit him to Holly Courts? Answer, no. 
question, because he is a Negro, is that correct? Or because he is non-white, is that correct? Yes, I would prefer to put it that way, uh, because he's non-white. So it's so important for us to know that it was thought that this was better for everybody to separate people. If they're happier in this way. Go back a little bit. Not everybody felt that way. Let's see. Um, The San Francisco Housing Authority in 1949, actually the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, excuse me, in 1949, prior to this, did cast a vote to oppose racial segregation in any program undertaken by the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency. So there were people on the inside who were wielding power, who were opposed to this, um, and they wanted to make discrimination a misdemeanor. This was struck down by the State, Com the State Community Redevelopment Act. So similar to the, um, the Rumford Fair Housing Act, similar to this, there were these sort of measures that were in that direction of equality, but they were often struck down for bogus reasons. So, so that's one example. Some of the conditions so we can see, this is from The Spokesman, which is a local paper to the Bay Area that's actually being digitized now at the library, so you can all go back and check this out. Um, and these, these were conditions that people lived in. This is, was not in the Chronicle, not in the Examiner, but the power of local papers, right? One of, they didn't have Twitter, they didn't have Facebook, they didn't have Instagram, but they had newspapers and they used them. The Sun Reporter, um, the Spokesman, these were papers that people read nationally, right? And we were a part of that. So you guys can see the fungus on the walls. Now in talking to both my students and community members, people still live in these types of conditions. They're painted over or they're patched up or they're just being torn down and then people aren't given vouchers and they're pushed out. This is what's happening right underneath our noses. And if you drive on the freeway and you see these old army barrack style housing, those are the remnants you know, of these things. So what do you do with the displaced people? Where do these people go? And why is it that this history isn't more known? Um, and you know, when I meet other scholars and professors and this is uh, from the spokesman, that same meeting that we saw from other places. They are so surprised that San Francisco has low-income housing communities. They're so surprised that an uh, uprising like this happened in San Francisco. So again, the question is not why San Francisco or how, but why have we overlooked it? We want to believe that San Francisco is this liberal place. We want to believe that there's at least one place that is immune from it. But this is a national problem. It has always been an American problem, and until we start to understand that no matter how liberal any place is, you can still have oppressed groups of people within that, right? And so I keep, I'm gonna keep coming back to that point. Like I tell my students, if I say it multiple times, it's important. <laughs> yeah. So this was a, a great gain. Maddie Banks was able to get housing. Um, what I found going back, even more interesting. So activism. In 1947, 46 interracial and community groups adopted a statewide platform. Now this is housing to fight restrictive covenants in the private housing sector. They formed the California Federation for Civic Unity. Now so again, the activism, you had it local, within small communities, small communities work together, and those communities statewide work together fighting. And, and I think that is so key to know that of how organized, how intersected all these struggles were and how, how people collaborated together was for me just exciting to, to find. I never heard of the California Federation for Civic Unity in my studies in California, but uh, thinking about how big California is, that's important. So these were Chinese communities, African American communities, Japanese communities, Japanese American, all coming together, all of whom who experienced the same social forces, right? So again, civil rights is not just black and white, these binaries that we use to understand our past are sometimes useful, but I think that this highlights the fact that various groups of people, all of whom were disenfranchised, were coming together in a common fight, in a common cause, and California was a model for that sort of interracial and intercommunal organization. And here you go, Mr. Perquet, 1957. Um, Willie May, center fielder for the San Francisco Giants, well known, very wealthy man, you know, uh, no reason why he should not have been able to purchase a home in San Francisco. He was denied purchase of a home in St. Francis Wood. 
Isn't it interesting that St. Francis Wood is the same place that the owner of Mel's Drive-In lived in too, who was being picketed? So, you know, it's an interesting dynamic here. This image is from the San Francisco Chronicle. And let me read you a little something um, about this. This e incident got national attention and was known as a Willie Mays incident. Um, the property owner argued when asked, why did you discriminate against him? Uh, argued that he was under tremendous pressure from the neighborhood not to sell to Negroes. The local NAACP president, John Adams Jr. and Field Secretary Lester P. Bailey observed that segregated islands of residency were springing up all over the city. Mays was only able to finalize the purchase of his home after much public pressure. This gave national attention that Willie Mays couldn't gain a home. So in an effort to maintain a liberal image of the city of San Francisco, the then mayor George Christopher offered Mays haven in his own home. Mays respectfully declined. No, thank you. <laughs> and following the purchase of the home, which after pressure, they finally said, OK. And what's interesting is the signing over of the house was also a very public event because they wanted to show, hey, no, we're, we're not racist. We're not the Jim Crow South. So Willie Mays, it's a public event. And the mayor was relieved after this press conference and said that this city of St. Fran Francis has retained its reputation as an understanding and progressive city. Thank goodness. But for African Americans who weren't Willie Mays, who weren't well-known figures, these practices continued on. If they, they did not have the press following them, and many middle and upper class African Americans were systematically denied housing in neighborhoods all throughout San Francisco. Um, and these practices continued out of the eyes of the press, and so therefore African Americans were primarily limited to neighborhoods like the Fillmore, like Bayview Hunters Point, and if you wanted to be a homeowner, maybe Lakeshore, you know, Lakeview, so these sort of small places where you can go. 65, the Watts Uprising, well known. We all know about this tragic event, the scale of it. Los Angeles, whole other city, whole other dynamic, but the same social forces that segregate people. Police brutality in Los Angeles was rampant. There was a different way in which people were policed based on their race in Los Angeles. But I'm not talking about the Watts Uprising today, necessarily. We are familiar with that. But I want us to think about what the impact of what Watts, that uprising, might, might have had on young people here in the Bay Area, who were just, just a few miles north. Um, so many public officials and residents who were not African American were shocked. Oh, black people here are angry, what's going on? How can this happen? For blacks, it Watts was an awakening, a warning, a realization, and a confirmation. I'm not condoning violence, but I think it's important for us to understand how this type of pressure built up over time can explode if you don't get at the source of it. Um, I think that it's really important for us to not blame the people, um, oftentimes young, often misguided, who engage, not misguided, right, but who often engage in this type of, these acts. But I also want to push us to rethink what, how we even categorize it. When we look at a riot, people taking to the streets, how do we think this country was formed? colonials rebelling violently sometimes against their mother country. So the, I, uh, the riot, speaking more broadly, has been a part of the political artillery, so to speak, of the United States. But we call some people patriots and we call others criminals. They're all fighting for the same thing, right? And so, you know, yes, I don't condone violence. I'm a nonviolent person. But I think, where is it coming from? And how, where do we see that throughout history? So Watts come to symbolize and glorify the rising up of an oppressed people. Such an ideology can serve as a rallying point for collective action. It can help ensure solidarity, act as a model for further violence, and justify similar future acts. So also, Oftentimes the people are um, targeted as they're just violent people. 
but this is happening within the larger context of violence. There was a culture of violence that was rampant throughout the country, that was rampant throughout the whole world. So again, let's think more about civil rights. The civil rights movement was not limited to one geographic area within the United States, nor was it limited to the United States. The civil rights movement in America is happening in the context of global liberation struggles. It's happening in the context of a war that has international implications. The president of the United States is assassinated. Malcolm X is assassinated. The Watts Rebellion is happening. The Vietnam War is happening. So this is, it's a, just a violent time. So when we're like, why these uprisings? They're not just a product of the black community, they are a product of the larger, just what was happening in the world, again. So placing things into a context is so important for our understanding. So that summer, we're leading up to 1966. In July, there was a near riot when robbery suspect uh, Frank Jackson was shot in the stomach by an off-duty police officer in the Fillmore. 200 young people gather, um, and he states, and this is quoted in the San Francisco Chronicle when they interview a young person, and this is a 1966 July. He says, you know what happened in Watts in Chicago? That's gonna happen here too. Um, so there was this, again, the consciousness, what was the impact on people here? And uh, it's, it's unfortunate how correct he was because in September 27th, 1966 in San Francisco, the exact same thing would happen. Matthew Peanut Johnson. This presentation is dedicated to his life and dedicated to the life of Linda Brooks Burton, who opened up those archives for me, and to the life of Matthew Peanut Johnson. He, like Oscar Grant, this is how I started off, was looking for work the week before he was killed. He was a beloved member of his community. Um, he descended from the original sort of migrants. He was one of those original families, as people I interviewed for oral history told me. And he made the wrong decision one afternoon, like many teenagers do. He was joyriding in a car, suspected to be stolen from Bacon and Girard um, in the Portola neighborhood. And off duty, or, or on duty, veteran officer Alvin Johnson saw them. They're young, they get scared, they stop and they flee from the car, leaving the car where it is. He pursues them. He eventually pursues Matthew Johnson is the only one left. He states that he fires four warning shots in the air as Matthew Johnson is running away, and a fifth happens to hit Matthew Johnson in the back. He falls into a ravine. This is happening at around three o'clock in the afternoon, so it's broad daylight. And, um, Menelik Walker, lifelong resident of Hunters Point, um, who Menelik Walker and, and others who I've interviewed have helped me greatly. He says, I remember the day. It was warm. It was during the summer and people was having balloon fights on Third Street. Common typical day in an urban setting in America, but underneath all that outward expression was a feeling of being mistreated. If it was a, it was a direct result of built up frustration, fear and anger. By the second day, there's a state of emergency that is called. All, nearly 2,000 National Guards are brought to the area, California Highway Patrol, San Francisco police. Um, but what's interesting about the first day is that it wasn't as violent. I believe it could have been contained. Young activists were trying to work with the San Francisco police. They called the mayor down, they wanted answers. They said, what is going forward? We need to give the community answers, otherwise we're not gonna be able to contain this. Let us, they formed a special youth, youth officers, special youth, they formed groups and started to police themselves because they learned from what happened in Watts. They were trying to prevent more violence. The next day, September 28th, third in Newcomb, there was word of a sniper. And the sniper myth is something we can talk about another day. There was no sniper ever found. But that was enough for National Guard to shoot into a crowd of people on third in Newcomb. Over the three days, 10 people are reported shot. Oral histories maybe say more, but we know for sure that 10 people were shot. Um, and this exposed the long-term problems of inadequate housing, unemployment, and police brutality in the area. By the last day, um, the violence had stopped. 
but the, a deep wound was left, one that is still healing to this day. Bayview Hunters Point was a thriving community. You didn't have to take the bus to go downtown to get what you needed for your house. All of that used to be there. But the, the storefronts that are boarded up, the broken windows are all remnants of this uprising in 66. And people in the community don't talk about it. It's been silenced because of how painful and traumatic it was to have tanks and people with bayonets coming down your community, coming down your street. Children, people afraid they have their children in the windows because they didn't want them to think that was a sniper and be shot. There were 200 children inside the Bayview Hunters Point Community Center right outside where the National Guard shot into the crowd and there were bullet holes that went through. The children are lying down on the ground. So this event in San Francisco is not well known, but I think it says a lot about the reality of America, that racism can exist anywhere, no matter how gilded its face is, right? This is a beautiful place, and I'm proud to be from San Francisco, but I don't think that we can be who we say we're gonna be until we acknowledge and embrace this history and support and embrace these communities that have survived this. A month and a half later, we all know the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense forms in Oakland. Now look, don't, I must say, I am not arguing that the 1966 uprising is a, di that the Black Panther Party is a direct result of the uprising. That's not my argument. There are other, you know, that's not, that's, that's not the truth. I am saying that it did help and was a part of a larger sort of black militancy that laid the foundation for the party. Don't think that Bobby Seale and Huey P. Newton, community college students, did not know about this, did not spend time in San Francisco, and that helped to motivate and confirm something that they were already doing. And I made this plug yesterday, but I'll make it again. They were community college students. So we think about these things happening only at universities, but we need to know that there will simultaneous and sister movements happening at the community college campuses, which speaks to the importance of community colleges. These were people the Black Panther Party wouldn't have formed if it hadn't been for community colleges. So also support your local community colleges, City College of San Francisco, which I work at. Many people who are in the audience are from City College of San Francisco, and it's one of the biggest community colleges in the nation. The African American Studies Department, founded in 1969 um, in San Francisco, was on the coattails of San Francisco State people who helped to found the ethnics, the first and only school of ethnic studies at City College of San Francisco also went to City College. So we need to recognize that education is a right um, and that it is super important to um, creating social change. Later on, and this is all looking at the impact, for me, the San Francisco State Student Movement is where everything comes together. Um, it was led by black, the Black Student Union or the Black Student Association and other affiliate student groups. Um, it was the longest student strike in US history at the time. They demanded curriculum, faculty, not just faculty, tenured faculty, you know? And I think this speaks to the importance of students, of young people. This was young people leading the movement. Ella Baker told they often advise young people to maintain your autonomy, to fight for what you believe in, because it's the young people that will lead us into the future. So I think one thing I want you to walk away from this presentation is that it is young college students, many of them, again, who are nameless and face, faceless, who laid a blueprint that would be duplicated on college campuses all throughout the country, and that's indigenous to this area, too, and speaks to this history. Some of those young people might have been in the uprising in 66. Some of those young people, you know, um, might have been in the Vietnam War. So we have to start drawing the connections because, you know, we all live at the intersection of our life experiences. So let's bring some things together, and I do want to leave some time for questions. So uh, there's a lot more to this, but we can't get it all in. So the culmination. San Francisco State, an example of this culminating nature of activism uh, and a model for the culminating social change that's happening by the time we get to the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, you have students from San Francisco State who are community members, maybe former community college students, mothers from Bayview Hunters Point in support of the student strikes, speaking, helping to organize, Black Panther Party members making regular visits to the Black Student Association and the Black Student Union on various campuses, but in particular, and also the assassination of Martin Luther King. 
and the impact that that had on people, what that did to people, how that galvanized and politicized people to create change. Uh, so this was a part of a larger continuum of civil rights and activism in the Bay Area, and there was a building of momentum. So in the Bay Area, you have the free speech movement, you have the anti-war movement, you have the black arts movement. There, this was such a hotbed for change, you know, for social activism. People came here to learn how to do it, and they took it to other places. But again, we don't really talk about the larger context. We talk about these events in the Bay Area in these isolated little pockets, but we need to start connecting the dots so we can have a broader sense and understanding. So we're gonna close by looking, bringing forward the voices of a couple different groups of people, and I wanna make a few closing points, and then I'll take uh, any questions that you guys have. So the footage we're about to watch now are of Bayview mothers, Eloise West Westbrook and Ruth Williams, two of Hunters Point's Big Five. There are streets named after them. These women were at the foundation of not only improving the neighborhood, but they're right up there with Fannie Lou Hamer. These women are the reason why we have redeveloped housing units. They're, the, they're a part of this legacy of black female activism, indigenous to the Bay Area. And so we're gonna look at their voices I think they have an important message. And this is at the San Francisco State Student Strike. I want you to know that I support you in everything that you're doing. I want you to know that I, I am a black woman, I'm a mother, and I have 15 grandchildren, and I want a college that I can be proud of. I don't have a one life to give children. When I die, I'm dead. And you better believe it. But I'm dying for the right our people. Thank you. Evan Williams mentioned that we have a variety of people here today, and I'm here to say I'm from the ghetto community. All right, now I'm from the ghetto community, and at the sound of my voice, when I rise up, just about the masses of Hunters Point rises up too. So I am. So I was very moved by not only just the passion that these women had, something that's also interesting, but their commitment to social change. Even as mothers who were busy raising families, they took the time to create the change that they wanted to see, and we still, and we uh, reap the fruits of their labor. Um, the Bayview Hunters Point Community Center, shortly after the uprising, loses, it, loses its lease. Um, many businesses move out of the area. There's a lack of investment. And in many ways, I feel like that community was punished uh, economically, was neglected economically as a result of what happened in 66. Um, you punish the communities by not investing, by not building better schools, by increasing the police, you know? And um, that's the world that I grew up in. So this history is about me trying to understand that. So another ancestor that I think I'm layering onto this is Martin Luther King, who I think has a very important message for us. Uh, he was at a press conference in San Francisco and I wanna close, I want, this will be the last clip we watch and I have a few closing points. but I've, I believe he has an important message, one in which I want, to, want you to carry, and I'll tie on some other things I want you to carry away with you today. Well, we all lost. Uh, I can't segmentize, uh, uh, isolate the civil rights movement as something over here in America, something over there. If anything, uh, the civil rights movement is a conscience of America, and uh, if we've had a summer of violence, which we had this summer and other summers, it's a reflection on the whole nation. We wouldn't have had that violence if the nation had moved forthrightly, progressively, and honestly toward a resolution of the problem. 
And I still contend that our nation's summers of riots are caused by our nation's winters of delay. And as long as justice is postponed, as long as these problems are there, we are on the verge of social disruption. And it hurts not only the black man, it hurts our whole nation. So those circumstances still exist today. The potential for the same violence we saw in 1966 and 65, we've seen still is there. And there are these tinderbox cities and communities. And we may be, the black population in San Francisco may be only 6%, but the fact that half of the people in the prisons are still African American speaks a lot to how these things still exist. So one takeaway, we need to support the black community. Go to Bayview Hunters Point and have lunch. Go visit. It's probably warmer. Um, it's a safe place. Uh, it's a place where, you know, we need to support it, not just in name by speaking it, but with your dollars, by walking down the street, by going to talk to some of the people there, looking at the historic buildings, visiting the library, um, because action is more important now than ever. You, can, you cannot afford to sit idly by anymore, and you're either actively fighting against oppression or you are passively condoning and perpetuating it. That's just, there's no in between. So racism, both sanctioned and unsanctioned by the law, existed in San Francisco and throughout the entire state of California and throughout the country. Jim Crow style forms of institutionalized racial discrimination and oppression were openly practiced in San Francisco, a known liberal state of the North, highlighting the fact that an oppressive state can exist within a liberal state. A liberal state can also be dependent upon the, existent, the existence and be dependent upon sustaining an oppressive state. So this liberal state that we have now, in many ways, is dependent upon a lower disenfranchised group of people. Every time you go out to eat, there is somebody there who is not getting paid what they should be getting paid to make whatever it is that you make. So if we think we're immune from this somehow, it's in our everyday. There are people every day who raise children um, that are not theirs every day that pick the greens that we eat, every day that clean the buildings that we work in at night, that are um, victims of these same systems and practices that African Americans were in the past 50 years ago to today. The civil rights movement, again, is a product of the black freedom struggle. They are not synonymous. And the black freedom struggle gave a language. The black freedom struggle in the West gave a language, a model, and a blueprint and a necessary pathway for a broader struggle known as the civil rights movement that united the causes of various disenfranchised groups of people, revealing a common struggle and a common fight. And in San Francisco, that war against oppression was waged. The freedom songs of the South echoed in the San Francisco Bay Area and the whole West. Thank you very much.